We were broken, sinful and wretched. A stain soaked deep into the fabric of humanity, consumed by death, covered in darkness, lost in the wilderness, set adrift in the vastness. But God, he was consumed too, unwilling to watch his creation wander endlessly, unable to sit by as we dove deeper into the abyss. He was overcome by love, by grace, by mercy. He took our pieces and gave them purpose. He took our shattered spirit and gave it hope. He took our destiny and reshaped it. Though we were unworthy, he counted us worthwhile. We were broken, but in the hands of God, we've been made whole. Well, good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Well, we are in week five of our series of messages on the Beatitudes, and this is from Matthew chapter five. This chapter and the two that follow are a sermon, and we know this text as the Sermon on the Mount, and the first 12 verses of the sermon we know as the Beatitudes. So let me refresh uh, your memory on the Beatitudes. Scripture, uh, Matthew chapter five, verses one through 12, Scripture says this. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this is our text uh, from Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. And these blessings that Jesus is pronouncing, uh, they really are very profound. And Jesus puts these characteristics in a particular order for a particular reason. Now, it's easy uh, for us to read through this text and want to pick and choose how they apply to our lives. It's easy to find ourselves in one characteristic, but to push back against another, thinking, well, that doesn't really apply to me. But it's vital that we recognize that these be attitudes in a very powerful way give us a roadmap of sorts of what it looks like and feels like to live a life of faith. And so uh, we need to recognize that as Christ followers, these characteristics should all be evident in our lives. Now, the first three of these Beatitudes are the process we go through of recognizing our own desperate condition, acknowledging that we are in need of a Savior for ourselves and that those around us need him too. We are poor in spirit as we acknowledge our sins and we let Jesus begin to spill out his mercy and forgiveness over us. And our hearts start to long for others to know him at least as well as we do. And so this godly mourning develops in us as we ache for those who are not experiencing the goodness and grace of God in their lives. And as we go through this process, we become more steadfast as we walk in submission to the ways of God. And, and quietness and trust is our strength. And these are the roots of a blessed life. And out of these roots is a new life that springs forth. And so last week we began to look at uh, what that new life looks like. And the first sprouts uh, come as we hunger and thirst for righteousness, which always comes out of knowing your need, mourning your sin, and submitting yourself to Jesus. That, uh, that hunger and thirst for righteousness will produce and nourish and sustain for a lifetime the soul of a godly life. And that is the true mark of a Christian because the flesh doesn't produce that in our lives. This hunger and thirst for righteousness, it is evidence of a spiritual life. It is evidence of spiritual health. 
And what we're going to come to realize about these Beatitudes is that the roots of the first three will produce the fruit that we see in verse 7, 8, and 9, the fruits of mercy, the fruit of purity, and the fruit of peace. And so today, we're going to jump in and look at the first fruit of blessing. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And so what does that mean to be merciful? What does that look like? And how can I be doing that in my own life? Well, the truth is many people misunderstand the power of mercy. Those who are merciful are, in this world, often seen as weak and powerless. The merciful are looked at uh, as though they are doormats to be walked on and take advantage of at every opportunity. But if you're in a position to be merciful, then you hold a position of power. And if you are not in a position to extend mercy, then it's likely that you are the one in need of mercy. And now, mercy basically has two component parts. The first is that there is a tenderness of heart. There's a compassion that arises. That's the first part. And the second component is that there is an action that flows from that compassion. So there's a compassionate and tenderness heart, uh, of heart and it is followed by an action. And so there's lots of places in scripture that we can see mercy at work. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 18 verses 21 through 35 today. Scripture there says this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and they told their master everything that had happened. The master called in the servant. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. So church, make no mistake, every single one of us stands in need of mercy. Here we see a servant who's very much in need of mercy. He's powerless to pay his debt that he owes to the master. And the master, who has all the power to be merciful, chooses to show mercy. But then the servant goes out, enters into a situation where he's no longer in need of mercy, but he has the power to be merciful to the man who owes him money. But even after such a great mercy had been shown to him, he chooses not to be merciful. And that choice comes back to bite him in a pretty big way. And uh, while it's true, you will reap what you sow, scripture says, right? But this circle of needing mercy at times and then being a person in a position to show mercy, we will all experience that in various positions and relationships in our lives. It's a circle, and what goes around comes back around. And those who are merciful are shown mercy, and those who are not merciful, well, it catches up to them. That's the way it works, right? It's the sowing and the reaping. Now, there are times that you'll find yourself in a position of needing mercy. And this could be for any number of reasons, whether you've done wrong or simply been accused of doing wrong. Maybe uh, you are in debt and you seek mercy from a debt collector. Maybe you've uh, purposely or unknowingly offended someone and you find yourself pleading for mercy and understanding. Maybe you find yourself uh, at the mercy of a police officer who intends to write you a ticket. Or from time to time, you might find yourself on the side of the road, broken down, in need of mercy and kindness from a stranger. Maybe you'll find yourself in need of uh, mercy from a banker of which you seek a loan. 
Or maybe you need mercy from someone you need a letter of recommendation from. Or maybe you'll find yourself face to face with the creator of the universe who will call to account every word you have spoken and every deed you have done. And you will need mercy. Make no mistake, every single one of us stands in need of mercy from the people that we come in contact with and from the God that we serve. And when you find yourself being granted mercy from someone, it truly is a happy day. It's a tremendous feeling of relief that comes over you as a mercy pours out on you. And there will be times when you are in a position where you can choose to be merciful or not to be merciful. Maybe you will be the one who is wronged. Maybe you will be the debtor who's owed. Maybe you'll be the stranger who can help. Maybe you're the banker and you can grant a loan. Maybe you will be the one uh, with the power in that situation. And what will you choose to do? Well, as God's people, we are to learn from and imitate God. And the character of God is mercy. And in the book of Exodus, God revealed himself to Moses in a fourfold description of his character. And this description is so important that it was repeated no less than seven times in the Old Testament. And this is a description that really gets to the core of what every redeemed person most needs to know about God. And that is this. In Exodus 34, verse 6, God said this. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So here is what you, as one of God's redeemed people, most need to know about him. That he is a tender heart of care towards you. That he is the God who is always acting for your good. And this message is carried throughout the New Testament as well. In Ephesians 2, we read that not only is God merciful, but that he is rich in mercy. In Titus 3, 5, it says he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. See, God, at the very core of his being, the God of mercy and grace and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he has uh, revealed himself in the flesh through Jesus. And what we find in Jesus is that he, too, is full of mercy, He's the merciful high priest, the one who stands at the right hand of the Father. The, the God is a God of mercy, and mercy is God's calling to us. What does the Lord require of you? We read in Matthew 6, 8, it is this, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly and to love mercy. Not just to do it, but to love it, to love mercy, to get as much of it as you can, to rejoice in it every time you see it, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Or as Jesus put it in one occasion, uh, when he said to one of the spiritual leaders of his day who didn't really understand uh, what spiritual leadership was all about, he said, go learn what this means. I desire mercy. God says, and not sacrifice. In other words, I'm not simply interested in the religious functions you are fulfilling. I'm looking at your heart and what's flowing out of your heart, and I want to see, is it a reflection of the heart of God? And so Jesus calls us to mercy. What a wonderful thing it is that the spirit of the merciful Lord Jesus would actually live in a believer who is already hungry for and thirsting after righteousness and wanting to be more and more like Jesus. And out of that momentum, say, all I want is to grasp and go after is mercy. So if you'll think for me, with me for a minute, what is the impact of one teacher in a school who really has a tender heart and cares about kids? and about other stuff, and about people, and about the administration. Think about the influence of one parent, of one person in a business, of one member of a church who really has a tender heart that cares and acts for the good of others. 
Think about how powerful that is. See, and now we're really getting to the point of what Jesus is calling us to right here. And uh, what I want to do uh, for the rest of this message is to try to suggest opportunities that you ha might have even just this week to be someone who has a tender heart that cares and acts for the good of others. In other words, to be someone who is merciful. And so I have a list of just five opportunities for mercy to manifest in your life. And I know I'm running out of time here, so uh, these are going to come at you pretty fast. But here's the first one. This week, make it a point to practice mercy in relation to material needs. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 says, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So straight up, we're talking about money here. We're talking about material things. And uh, I think of the story of the Good Samaritan, in which we, we find that in Luke chapter 10. And most of us know that story. A man is on his way to Jericho. He's attacked by robbers. He's stripped and beaten and left for dead on the road. And many people walked by this man, and they did nothing. But one man, a Samaritan, saw him, had mercy on him, and acted for his good. He picked him up, he dressed his wounds, he put him on his donkey, he took him to town, got him a room at the local inn and provided the necessary money to make sure that that man would be taken care of until he recovered. See, that's one example of practicing mercy in relation to material needs. And maybe even more to the point is something that uh, theologian Sinclair Ferguson writes regarding mercy. He says this, Mercy is getting down on your hands and knees and doing something to restore dignity to someone whose life has been broken by sin. And he says this about the Good Samaritan. He says, notice that the Samaritan did not deal with the cause of the man's need by chasing the robbers. That might be a reasonable thing to do, but that's not mercy. Nor, he says, did the Samaritan complain about the failure of society to meet the man's need. And that may be a legitimate thing to do, but that's not mercy. Instead, the Samaritan addressed the immediate need that was set before him, and he did what he could to bring the relief. And so that's what it looks like to practice mercy in relation to material needs. In church, there will be opportunities for every one of us to do uh, that very same thing in some way, shape, or form this week. Number two is this, <clears throat> and it's straight <clears throat> from Jude chapter 1, verse 22. Have mercy on those who doubt, Scripture says. Now, isn't that interesting? Doubting is not a material need. Doubting is a spiritual struggle. And we are commanded to exercise mercy in relation to this. God calls us, in other words, to have tender hearts toward brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling with their faith and to have mercy on those who doubt. This is one way that we can be an encouragement to people. And quite frankly, uh, it's difficult at times. And maybe we need to start framing this as a prayer that we might pray each day uh, to remind ourselves. Maybe our prayer sounds something like this. Lord, save me from being hard and demanding. Make me tender towards others, sensitive towards the load that others bear, and faithful in bringing help as Jesus Christ, my Savior, is faithful to me. My Jesus, he doesn't break the bruised reed. And if there's a little flame with just a, a wick that's just about to go out, he doesn't snuff it out. God help me to be more like that. Help me to be an instrument of encouragement and mercy. Well, David says this in Psalm 1835. I love this. He says, oh God, it is your gentleness that has made me great. See, that's the nature of God. And God says that we are to be merciful to those who doubt. Number three, practice mercy in situations of embarrassing failure. There's a pretty good possibility that this week you will spot someone dealing with an embarrassing failure. Someone at work maybe uh, made a catastrophic mess up and they're embarrassed about it and uh, you could make a big deal of it. Or you could just be kind and extend mercy and help them not to feel so horrible about what happened. First Peter uh, in chapter 4 talks about how love covers over a multitude of sins. 
And really what that means, that uh, as people of God, we should be letting love speak louder than judgment. First, let me just make it clear that there are some things that should never be covered over, right? (laughs) But Peter's talking about sins, not crimes here. So there's a difference. And with that in mind, we need to recognize that love extends mercy, and a merciful person will gladly cover over a multitude of sins. Charles Spurgeon is quoted as saying this. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, may you always have one blind eye and one deaf ear. Notice he does say one, because in this fallen world, of course, you do need to have one good eye and one good ear. But it's interesting that Spurgeon adds this comment. He says, my blind eye is the best eye that I have, and my deaf ear is the best ear that I have. In other words, what he's saying is this, a hard-hearted person is always making a big deal of little failures, and a tender heart is going the other way. A tender heart often covers little failures over with a blind eye and a deaf ear. So when did you last use your blind eye and your deaf ear? Have you got one? Or is everything an issue for you? And if that's the case, you won't have friends for long and you won't be a blessing to anybody. You'll be very, very difficult to live with. So develop that blind eye and that deaf ear. God does not treat us as our sins deserve. Thank you, Jesus. Nor does God repay us according to our iniquities. But he is merciful and his love is poured out over us and it covers a multitude of sins. So when you have the opportunity, cover over someone's embarrassing failure this week in kindness. Here's number four. Refuse slanderous gossip. Philippians 4, 8 says this. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Now, this is a a command of Scripture, and so we want to see the good and not gobble up the gossip, the the half-truths of the enemy. Because we know that most gossip is built on lies, and someone once said that it is uh, as bad to repeat a lie as it is to invent one. It's so easy uh, to fall into that trap of making much of other people's failures and paying so little attention to their virtues. But a merciful person will choose to talk more about someone's virtues than they will about their failings. And a merciful person will close his or her ear to slander. Thomas Watson says that a man's name is more valuable than his goods, and he who takes away the good name of another sins more than if he had taken the corn out of his field or the goods out of his shop. And you might say, well, I would never break into a shop and steal, but Thomas Watson says if you take away a man's good name in gossip or pass on some negativity or draw attention to his failings, you are doing something that he says is worse than if you took goods out of their shop. Then he says this, he says that the one who receives stolen goods is as bad as the one who steals them. He says, we must not raise a false report and we must not take one up, for it is better to take away a man's life than to take away his good name. That bears thinking about the next time you hear a juicy story, especially one that you don't know for sure is the whole truth, showing mercy by not receiving and not spreading gossip. And here's the last one, number five. Practice mercy in relation to unreasonable expectations. Psalm 103, 13 says this, God knows how we were formed and he remembers that we are dust. And I don't know about you, but I am very grateful that God remembers that I am dust. And my job is to remember this in in relation to others as well. And, And what that means is that I must not set unreasonable expectations of people around me 
that I must learn not to be surprised by discouragements and by disappointments, that I must get beyond the place of thinking that because a person professes to be a Christian that somehow they will make, a, uh, will make them consistently right or better or perfect. I must recognize instead that every single one of us carries a burden, bears a weight, has temptations that they must fa face and they will fail to meet most of them. I must remember that they are dust, just as God remembers that I am dust. And that will help me to leave room for God's mercy and grace in my relationships on this earth. So there are just five examples of opportunities that each of us are likely to encounter this week. And we'll have the opportunity to be merciful to others. And the promise and pronouncement from Jesus is, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Jesus' very death on the cross was an act of mercy poured out on all of God's people. He paid for our sins. He took our judgment. He took our punishment upon himself so that we may have life and peace and fellowship with God, even though we deserve death and separation from God. God, in his great mercy, made us alive in Christ. He made us whole. God is the source of mercy. He's the one who enables us to be people of mercy. And as we walk through this circle of needing mercy and extending mercy, we get such an amazing understanding of God's heart and his grace. So church, may we not only know his mercy, but may we live it. May we be people who are merciful, those who have a tender heart that cares and acts for the good of others, that God may be glorified in and through us in a very real and a very powerful way. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love that has covered over such a multitude of sins in our own lives. And we thank you that you give us the opportunity not just to be merciful to others, but also to live under your mercy for ourselves. God, you give us the opportunity to know you in a very real and a very powerful way. You give us the opportunity to extend that love, that grace, that mercy all around us all the time. God, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us this week, that you would help um, us to see where you're giving us those opportunities to extend mercy, and that you would help us to be through the, the source of your power and your mercy and your love. Help us to be merciful to the others that are in our lives, to the people that we come in contact with, to those in our homes, in our, in our church, in our lives. God, we want to be reflections of you and at the very core of who you are, you're merciful. God, we pray that you would help us to do likewise. God, again, we just, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to be part of your kingdom, to be part of your work on this earth. That not only have you called us and redeemed us, but you've called us to go and be and do in your name. And it's an amazing privilege. It's an amazing opportunity to be your hands and feet on this earth, and we just thank you for it. And we thank you and we praise you for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know what the Lord is speaking to you through this message, but your invitation is to identify what next steps he might be calling you to take. Maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's information, maybe it's something that God's been talking to you for uh, about for a while, and you've just pushed back against it time and time again. But today... This is the day that you say, I'm going to stop pushing and I'm going to start embracing. I'm going to take that next step in faith. Whatever it is, we'd invite you to connect with us if we can be of an encouragement to you in any way. We'd be honored to walk with you, to pray with you, uh, just to, to do life with you. That together we might grow closer and closer to Jesus. Well, now as we continue uh, here in house.